Good morning. How are you guys doing? Doing all right. Good. Um, we got a lot of echoes. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm grabbing. Check, check. One, two. You hear me now? Good. Horizon. All right. Good. <laughs> um, let's just uh, let's just consecrate this time this morning in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your heart. We thank you, Lord, that all of your favorite kids are sitting in here this morning. And we thank you that you love us. Speak to us. Right now, I just invite you where you're at. Ask the Lord to open your ears to hear what he has for you this morning. Ask him right now to open your heart to receive his word. God, I ask you, Lord, that you would deposit your word in our hearts. May it be a seed that brings forth a massive fruit. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I think it sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Me. Does it sound good? Good. Okay, cool. Uh, well, my name is David Morrison, and it is such a privilege to be with you guys um, with Extreme Nazarene. We've got my buddy, Reverend Nathan Roscom over here. Um, I love to highlight Reverend um, because I'm not there yet, so I love to honor the people above me. That's great. Um, so, yeah. I want to first just begin by thanking you, Pastor Curtis, for allowing me to be in your pulpit um, without really knowing me. That is a, a mighty honor. Uh, you have placed your trust in me, and I, I honor you, and I promise to not let you down. Um, don't you guys love your pastors? Yeah? Good. Good. Um, well, buenos dias. Buenos dias. Do we have that slide up there? Uh, so I was a missionary in Ecuador for two and a half years, and this is how we would begin Every service, we would say, como estamos, which means, how are we doing, right? So I'm going to say, como estamos, and you guys are going to respond how we would respond in Ecuador. I'm going to say, como estamos, and you guys are going to say, bendecidos, blessed, prosperados, prospered, y en victoria, and victorious, right? In victory, okay? So I'm going to say it, right? I want you guys just to repeat after me real quick. Bendecidos, bendecidos, prosperados, prosperados, y en victoria, y en victoria. All right, so you guys... Well, first you got to believe it, that you're, you're blessed, prosperous. <laughs> All right, so one more time. Bendecidos. Bendecidos. Prosperados. Prosperados. Y en victoria. Y en victoria. All right, ready? I'm going to say, como estamos? And you guys are just going to go all three at the same time. Ready? One, two, three. Como estamos? Bendecidos. Prosperados. Y en victoria. Bravo. Round of applause for you guys. That was great. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about myself before we head into the Word, uh, just to give you some history. So I grew up, I am a third generation Nazarener, um, as you could call it. Uh, my father is a Nazarene pastor, and his father was a Nazarene pastor back in the almost the founding days of the Church of the Nazarene. Um, so rich heritage. Um, so I love the church. I love what God is doing in the church, and I love that we are all the church. Um, I have two brothers. I'm the middle child there, the cream of the Oreo. Um, <laughs> I'll be the last to get married, but I'm ready for that. I'm excited. Um, yeah, next picture. I spent most of my late teen years and my young adult years touring around the world in a, in a heavy metal Christian band called For Today. Um, literally, I know someone's like, heavy metal Christian, how does it blend? But God will use the arts to reach our generation. He is doing that. Um, tour to 18 countries all over the world uh, for eight years, and that band is still going today. Um, next picture there, there's just some places that we, we would minister in. Uh, we were in Paris the day that there was a, uh, it was a Harley Davidson uh, rally at the Eiffel Tower, and they were burning flags and everything, where they're just being Jesus, ministering to people. Um, so that is, <laughs> that is some of my history and some of the things I was able to do. A tour in the band, we saw sick people healed, saw blind eyes open, you name it. Um, so let me just say today, there's an open heaven over this place. Um, yesterday I was at what they're calling the, the beginning of the third great awakening in America. It was called Azusa Now, 110 year anniversary for the Azusa Street Revival. Um, and there, there's been a shift in America right now and you guys are in it. So welcome. Welcome to the third great awakening. It's exciting. Um, I want to share with you guys a little bit about my story um, and I hope that it touches your heart. And um, I know that the Lord has a story for every single one of us and he's still writing it. So be encouraged. If the, if, you're, if the beginning of your story is discouraging or it wasn't that pretty, don't worry. God's pen is really pretty, and he only <laughs> writes good things. Um, and we were on tour, and it was April 2012, and the Lord spoke to me audibly, clear as day. And he said, David, you're going to be a missionary. 
And I honestly said, what? <laughs> um, and we were praying at a show for kids. We were praying for teenagers that, that, that as we played, the Lord would move and many people would be reached for Christ. Uh, I said, what do you mean? Or, uh, is it, what is that? And he said, you're going to be a missionary. He just confirmed that. It was six weeks later in prayer. We finished our tour there, and then we toured Europe and got back and just sought the Lord day after day. I said, God, with who? Where do I go? Why? And then he said, you're going to go to South America in September with Extreme Nazarene. So next picture there. Um, gave up my m musical career. <laughs> uh, gave up earthly success um, and a strong ministry to go and do exactly what the Lord told me to do and be a missionary with Extreme Nazarene. So that is a picture of Ambato, Ecuador. Everybody say with me, Ambato. Ambato. Man, you guys have a really good accent. Is that a California <laughs> thing? Okay, because I have preached in North Dakota, and when we do... <laughs> You guys already got it. I didn't even have to answer the tagline. Um, yeah. Ambato. Uh, Ambato is a business city of about a quarter million people. Um, and the Church of the Nazarene had tried time and time again, three times, to plant a church in that city. And every time it failed. Um, they even had a piece of land that they could never build on because the church plant would always fail. Um, here... Spiritually prideful to say that we were able to plant that church. It's not a, it's not a personal pride thing. It's a proud of the Lord because he's faithful and able to do that. Um, so where is Ecuador? As you can see there on the screen, uh, you've got North America up top. That big giant thing above it is Canada. No one knows where that is. Um, then you got Central America. South America is the big, almost African-looking continent there. And the orange is the small yet gorgeous country of Ecuador, where I lived, 2012 to 2015. Um, in the city of Ambato, you have to be careful because it is surrounded by volcanoes. Next picture. That is our, <laughs> that is my favorite selfie I've ever taken. Um, I took that out front of our church. Literally one day we were having worship practice and volcano Tungurawa, everybody say with me, Tungurawa. Tungurawa. Still pretty, still pretty good, <laughs> right, Pastor? Yeah, um, so she is active. They call her the mother Tungurawa, Mama Tungurawa. Um, and uh, she mothers other volcanoes in the area. Uh, Ecuador is one of the most active volcanic countries in the world. Uh, she sits at 20,000 feet, and I was just there last week, and she was erupting again. So um, you always have to be on your toes in Ecuador. Uh, next picture here. This is the team that I served on. Uh, I believe Nate was here. I know Nate was here before. And uh, I believe he shared a little bit about what we do. But we send primarily young adults, a team of 10. We were a team of eight young adults. Half of us from the States, half of us from Ecuador, the planting city, um, the planting country. And then we send a family to help mentor and pastor that, those young adults, and as well as a national pastor's family from the seminary. Uh, so that was our wonderful team there. Um, go back one more second. I am an engaged man, engaged to marry the beautiful gal there, middle, right next to me there, not the pregnant one. The <laughs> <laughs> Just don't want you guys to get any ideas that I'm leading a double life on the mission field. That was our pastor's wife, and she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. Um, yes, so the Lord blesses, right? I, I received a large blessing when I finished uh, my time there in Ecuador. Next picture here. This was my ministry partner, Ariel. Everybody say Ariel. Ariel. I was at Disneyland on Friday and we saw Ariel's adventure <laughs> and all of the Little Mermaid stuff and we always gave him grief that his name was a mermaid. Uh, <laughs> he wasn't into that. Um, and many people say that we look very similar in this picture, like brothers. Um, and we are, uh, just not from the same mother. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we ministered together for two years in Ambato, Ecuador, and we saw the Lord literally open heavens. Um, we saw so many people come to the Lord that would have never met him had we not said yes to the call. Um, God could have used us in many other ways, but he said, I'll send you if you'll go, right? Um, so we said yes to his call, and the Lord was faithful. I want to show you guys um, our humble beginnings here. That was where we first started. We rented a storefront building. You guys, the Lord can do anything. Everything that we do on the mission field can be applied. Applied. <laughs> My parents live in North Dakota. <laughs> to the States. 
Um, so we started in just a storefront building. We had uh, not even 100 chairs to begin. Remember our first Sunday, we had about 40 people in there after we labored a month long doing events every day on the street. Uh, next picture, this was after we knocked out that wall there you saw on the left, and we expanded the sanctuary. So in Jesus' name, wall be removed. Um, and the Lord continued to bless. That was our one-year anniversary there. Um, the highest attendance we ever had, 158 people or so. Um, so to serve in a city for one year, doing exactly what the Lord calls you to do, and to see that fruit, you can't. Uh, are any of you guys dads in here? Yeah. You guys know when you see your, your little boy or your little girl, like, meet that first accomplishment in their lives, you know, they take their first steps, or they hit the first ball, and how proud you are of them? This was our baby. Um, and that, for me, my heart was so full. Uh, I was there last week um, preaching, or two weeks ago, Easter Sunday, uh, preaching there in Ambato, and the Lord is still moving. They have shrunk in size. Um, but I want you guys to just get involved with me for one second. Can we all just bow our heads, close our eyes? I want you guys to join with me in a prayer, crying out that God would bless the church of Ambato. And I invite you, if you are comfortable, in fact, I would love to invite you to get uncomfortable, to pray out loud with me as I pray. You don't have to. Father, we thank you, Lord, and we ask you, God, that you would continue to release revival in the Church of the Nazarene and Ambato, God. God, we ask you, Lord, that your spirit would speak to people there, God. We pray that salvation would be made known all over the city, that people would get to know the man Jesus, and that you, God, would change them as you do. Lord, I pray that you would reveal your love to them. We ask, Lord, that you would protect them and bless them on this day as they meet as well. In your name we pray. Amen. So you guys all literally just joined Extreme Nazarene Missions. So welcome to the organization. Thank you for praying for our church. Uh, I want to transition into the Word of God this morning. Do you guys love this book? Yes. Yeah. Do you guys know the man of this book? Yes. All right. Let's get to know him a little bit. Let's turn to the book of Luke. I'm going to go to Luke chapter 8. I can't tell you guys how excited I am to be here. Yesterday I spent, it was 15 hours uh, without a single break worshiping the Lord and crying out for revival in America in LA at the Coliseum. There's 100,000 people, um, and I believe that today is just as powerful, just as important, and that all of you guys play a wonderful piece to God's revival story. He's reviving this country. Do you guys believe that? Amen. Amen. Yes. So, we're going to go to verse 26. This is the story of Jesus restoring a demon-possessed man. Uh, and it's very relatable today, and I want to pull out a whole bunch of golden nuggets from it, and I want you guys to track with me as we read. So we're going to read a large portion of scripture here, um, and if you guys got your pens, or if you're on your phone, or your tablet, begin to underline things that speak to you, and we're going to go through this. Luke 8, 26. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee, and when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but he lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained both hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. And Jesus asked him, verse 30, Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. So maybe you guys know the rest of the story here. It says, a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And the demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake, and they all drowned. Poor little piggies. <laughs> When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, verse 39, return home and tell how much God has done for you. 
So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. So I hope you guys are, are tracking with me on this one, but we've got this crazy guy, right? So let's relate this to here in Livermore, right? So we got this crazy guy running around town. He just escaped from Looneyville, right? He's demon-possessed. He's not dressed. He's naked. He's been kept at maximum security prison. He's breaking out all the time. The guy's absolutely bonkers, right? He's losing it. Um, and it's not him, right? It's the demons inside of him making him manifest like that, right? Um, and so then Jesus shows up meets the man, and what's the first thing Jesus asks him? Verse 30, right? He says, what is your name? So I look out to you guys today, right? Just pretend I'm Jesus, this beautiful figure, right? <laughs> what is your name? And the first thing he does is he says, legion, right? Which means a multitude of demons. He, there's no way his name was legion, right? Just like my name is not X into pornography. It's not my name. It's not who I am. He identifies with his sin status. He identifies and becomes the spiritual nature that he's in. And many times, many of us here in Livermore, right, or in Boise where I live, many times we become what we do. We become our spiritual state. And God today is saying, I have called you to be sons and daughters of the Most High. So when I ask what your name is, your name is son. When I ask what your name is, your name is daughter. I believe, this is extra, extra scriptural, it's not in there, but I believe in like the, the notes on the side. I believe that Jesus gave him a new name, and I believe that his name was never Legion, right? So I want us to just think about that today. Many times we identify with our problems, and we give more power to the depression, to the anxiety, to the fear, right? To the addictions than to Jesus. Right. The healing, right. the one who sets us free. Lord. So then what happens, he, he finds out his name, but we fast forward, right? Jesus just talks to him for a minute, and then what happens? We find the man Legion sitting at Jesus' feet. The whole town comes in. They find this guy, this craziest dude ever. They find him sitting at Jesus' feet. Is he naked anymore? Nope. He's dressed. Is he crazy anymore? He says he's in his right mind. He's fully restored and healed, where do you get the clothes from? It doesn't talk about that in the Bible, but I have to believe, I have to believe that Jesus gave the man his clothes. I have to believe that. I have to believe that Jesus gave him a new name. I think there are many people here today, and I think a lot of us came here to hear an exciting missionary story, and we're going to hear a bunch of them, but I want the Lord to deal with our hearts first. And so I just want to share with you guys right now that whatever you came in here with, you can sit today at Jesus' feet and have him clothe you. You can sit today at Jesus' feet and have him free your mind. If any of you guys are tormented, the Lord will free you. If any of you guys are struggling with depression, the Lord will free you. If any of you guys are struggling with anxiety, the Lord will free you because Jesus loves you. And you are not who you once were. It says, if any man comes to Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, and the new has come. Do you guys believe that with me this morning? Yes. And say amen. 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 So then what happens to Legion, ex-Legion, right? We'll call him ex-Legion. So ex-Legion comes up to Jesus afterwards and says, I want to go with you in the boat, right? The pig happens, all that stuff. The town's not very happy because they were a commodity. And he says, I want to go with you. And what does Jesus tell him? I like that face. She's like, mm-mm. <laughs> no, mm-mm. Jesus is like, mm-mm. No. Jesus says, I want you to stay and tell everyone about what God did for you today. And so for me, uh, I was not demon-possessed, praise the Lord, but I can relate to part of this story. When I finished my time in Ecuador, I was asking the Lord, I was crying out to God. I said, God, send me to Cambodia. I want to go. Send me to Cambodia. I, had, I thought I had a really good plan. And God said, No. God said no, and he told me to do almost the exact same thing. He said, I want you to go back to the States, work with Extreme out of Idaho. That was the literal wording. But then my, my, my calling after that, God has said, I want you to go and encourage the church. I want you to go and tell the church what I'm doing, and I want you to send the church. So that's what I'm here to do this morning, but I want you guys to know, and so why would this happen? Why would Jesus tell him to go and testify? If you know the, the four Gospels, you know that to almost everybody else, Jesus said, shh, right? 
Jesus was like, don't, don't tell anybody what's going on. Because they were, they were, the Jews were going crazy. They were trying to make him king, right, by force. And it wasn't time. Jesus kept saying, it's not time for me to be glorified. It's not time yet. But this man over there by the Gerasenes, this was not a Jew. This was a Gentile. We today, probably, I would, I would gather most of us, are gent. I personally am a Gentile, right? I mean, that means non-Jew. <laughs> Many of us are in that state of mind, and Jesus is saying, go and tell everyone what God has done for you. Don't worry. Don't worry about what could happen to you. Go and tell everyone about what God has done for you. And why? Why did he tell them to do that? Because Jesus brought the gospel for all. Jesus brought the good news for everybody. There's not, you can't wear bad enough clothes. You can't have a status that's unreachable by God. You can't live in a neighborhood that Jesus doesn't want to come and meet. Jesus would go to these places on purpose to meet the people that the church said they are not allowed in. They're unclean is what the Jews would have called them. They are not grafted in. They cannot be saved by God. And Jesus said, I will come and I will save them. And he meets one and he changes his whole life. He gives them this clothes off of his back, right? Because we know Jesus didn't carry the extra bag. It's what he told his disciples to do. Um, he gives them the clothes off of his back. And then he sends it back. He says, go and tell everybody in the town. And I'm so bummed out. I'm so, so, so bummed that the next chapter doesn't share about <laughs> X Legion's story. I'm so bummed out. I cannot wait to get to heaven and learn about it. I have some ideas. I feel like we can draw from some other stories in the Bible what happened um, but what happens, guys, when you testify, I think this is on the screen, when you testify, you release faith, literally, for that same thing to happen again, right? So whatever the Lord frees you from, whatever fear he releases you from, anything that you're struggling with and the Lord breaks that off, when you testify and tell someone that, when you say, Pastor Curtis, I got a testimony. I heard uh, you shared a praise today. That's awesome. It helps us all be able to believe that that same miracle that happened to you or that happened to Grandma Joanne can happen to me. So I want to encourage you and charge and exhort you, church, testify. Share what the Lord is doing right. in your life. Amen. And I, this was not, I, I just wanted to share this to you. In, in John 4, you don't even have to go there, but in John 4, Jesus meets the woman at the well. Also a Samaritan woman, should not, does not belong in the church at this point in time. The Jews basically hate her. She's steeped in all sorts of sin. She's got all sorts of different dudes she's sleeping around with. It's a mess, right? Jesus knew all of it. She's, she's shocked. But then what does she do? She goes back to the Samaritan village and shares about what God did to her. I'll just read you this really quick. John 4, 39 says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And she said, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. Because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. So what happens is when you testify, you release like the first wave. When you testify, you release that initial faith for people to believe. But then they got to get to know the source. Then they got to get to know the man who did it, right? So like when God frees you from that, you share that with someone who doesn't know the Lord, I promise you, your testimony will impact your friends, will impact the people in your workplace, and will impact your family because you are a real person. And you deal with real everyday issues. And maybe not all of you are ex-drug addicts. Or maybe not all of you have this crazy story where God freed you from prison. I met some people from the Cali Columbia drug cartel a couple of weeks ago. Um, a couple of our friends of mine now. Um, who the Lord literally did free out of prison. And, and he had the prison guard lead them to the Lord. And just the craziest story you could ever imagine, right? That'll preach. Anywhere. <laughs> that guy could get on stage in front of a million people and have everybody weeping because the story is insane. But you guys might not be able to do that, but the Lord is saying, I gave you a family. I gave you a workplace. I gave you kids. Right? I gave you a neighborhood. That's your assignment. Go. Right? Our lovely pastor's wife, I forgot your name. Jane. Jane read us out of Matthew 28 and it says, Therefore, all, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. And it says, Therefore, go. So God's got all the authority, and he sends you guys to your places of influence. This lady inspired people by, their, by her testimony, but they were changed by the source. So that's what's going to happen. I know that will happen in all of your lives. I literally just declare right now. That will happen in all of your lives. 
As you share the testimony with people, you inspire them, they will get fired up, they will believe that, that can happen to them, but then you need to lead them to the cross where they will meet the man, they will meet the source of that miracle in your own life. Inspired by the testimony and changed by the source. I just want to show for you guys real quick where this comes from before we go into a cool, cool story. Um, testify in the Hebrew, um, it it's not on the screen. I apologize about that. But in Hebrew, the word for testify is eduth, which means witness or to give account or evidence of something. With that word comes from a primitive root word. I want you guys to all try and say this with me. Ayin vabdaleth. <laughs> He's just shaking his head. That's not happening. <laughs> so that primitive root means to return, to repeat, or to do Again, so in the Bible, when it talks about testimony, it's not just talking about sharing something that happened, past tense. It's talking about sharing something that happened and then also allowing everyone else to believe that that will repeat, return, or happen again. Amen? So when you share a testimony, you give an account. You are evidence. You are testimony of something that happened, and you say, I believe it will happen again here in this place. Amen? You guys, you guys look really bored. Amen? <laughs> Good. So I was preaching in Ecuador last week, and it's, it's loud when you preach there. Like, Amen! <laughs> they just yell. So praise the Lord for our differences in volumes. Um, David was a testifying man. That one is on the screen. Uh, Psalm 107, too, right? It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. It's saying, if God has redeemed you, Tell someone. <laughs> That's what it's saying in 2016 English. Let those who have been redeemed of the Lord have permission to tell everybody. Right. If God's freed you from trouble, go and tell the world. Right. Well, you know that old Christian song, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, and everywhere, <laughs> you know, right? I didn't want to sing that song this morning because we don't need that. But <laughs> it's just so old, and it touched my heart a long time ago. But I think God's releasing a new song through his children today, and it's called Your Testimony. And he wants you to share it with people. So I challenge you to do that. To not hide what the Lord has done for you. To share it with others. To retweet it on your Twitter. Everything that you must do to get the word of the Lord out. Amen? Amen. 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 And then I want you guys, if you're dealing with something today, and God's still writing your testimony, I want you to be encouraged that God is inviting each one of you to come and sit at his feet. Come and let him dress you of the things that you lack. And to let him free the things that you need to be free from. Right. Jesus will do that for you even today. Amen. So be encouraged. All right. I want to share with you guys a really awesome story about a gal named Guadalupe. I believe we got a picture of her up there. Yes. Um, so that is me and Guadalupe on the other side there of the screen. She is just a cute little four foot, comes at a whopping four foot nine, I think. Um, so she comes up to about here on me. I saw her last week, gave her the biggest hug. Um, my, some of my friends call her uh, a teddy bear because she just is. She's just adorable. Um, but Guadalupe, I met her in 2014. We were doing an event in Ecuador called Love Extreme, where we're bringing in a lot of people from the States, and maybe hopefully you guys can come uh, to these one time. We bring a lot of people from the States, and we just bless the communities that we're in. So we had doctors and nurses, and so we put on a medical clinic. And so I'm translating at the medical clinic because, gracias a Dios, puedo hablar dos idiomas. Praise the Lord, I can speak two languages. Um, my friends in the back, I know they understood me. <laughs> uh, we met earlier this morning. So I'm translating at this medical clinic. Let's go back to Guadalupe there. I'm translating at this medical clinic. You see this whole just family from here on up come through. The little kids come through. We talk to them. They're like, my tummy hurts sometimes. So, you know, we give them some vitamins, and, and it keeps coming through. And then you've got some adults come through. The parents come through. And then finally an older gentleman comes through. And then finally a cute little Guadalupe comes through. And she begins to share about how her life is just, just a mess. Whoa. It's just a mess. It's that bad. And she shares how she can't sleep. She's got total anxiety. Her hair is falling out. Um, she has high blood pressure, um, she's having seizures, uh, lack of sleep, um, and her whole world is just kind of falling apart, and there was a reason for all that, and we could just see the fear welling up in her eyes, 
And as she shared with us what was wrong, so we could release her over to the doctor, uh, we just stopped and said, you know, can, I, can we just pray for you? You can just see the stress all over. Um, she said, yeah, that'd be great. So we laid hands on her and we just prayed, you know, that God's peace would just overwhelm her. And it did. Um, and uh, with teary eyes, you know, she gave us a hug and left. And we said, hey, you know, tomorrow night we really want you to come to the La Lama Theater. We're having a large event that you cannot miss. It's going to be amazing. God's going to show up and he's going to touch everyone. And she was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to bring my whole family. <laughs> well, the first rule of missions is to be flexible. And the second rule of missions is to not let yourself get let down. <laughs> because you will invite thousands and thousands of people to things and you'll see a few. A few will show up um, in, in the long term. And so, you know, I thought oh, it would be so great for Guadalupe to come to this event tomorrow. But I had no idea if she'd actually make it. The next night, we had Pastor Fernet an ex-drug cartel member from the Cali Colombia drug cartel. If you know the story of uh, Pablo Escobar, the Cali cartel was the one that conquered his cartel and superseded them at one point, the largest cocaine dealing cartel in the world. Um, and he has since been set free from that. He works full time at the largest church in the Nazarene in the world in Cali Colombia. And his testimony is used all over the world now um, to free the captives from sin. We invited him to come and speak at Love Extreme. We've got a picture there of the event. Um, so those were the people standing up, raising their hands, saying, I want to accept Christ. I believe, God, that you love me. And that if you changed him, you can, sure, you can for sure change me. So Guadalupe was in that crowd. Her whole family shows up. She gets saved. We go out and we pray for everybody afterwards and we get their information. Next Sunday, first one in the doors. Little Guadalupe, four foot nine, comes in, just smile on her face. We're so excited. We just prayed with her, and you know that God would really grow what He had planted in her life. So we fast forward to this day. This is a month later. Uh, literally, Guadalupe was the first person to show up for our pastor wife's birthday party in the church with uh, the other leaders. So it was just myself and another gal from our church plant there. And so when she came, she was sharing testimonies with me. And the other guy wanted to practice her photography skills, <laughs> actually, and snapped this photo while she told me one of the most harrowing stories I had ever heard. She began to share with me about how her life and the reason why she's losing her hair and dealing with all these issues had gone downhill. And she said that several years prior, she used to work for a Catholic nonprofit credit union there in Ecuador. Um, it went really well, and her and the ladies that she worked with were really good at managing money, and they made their living on the side as well, and they worked up a savings, and one day she told the other gal, we should start our own credit union for profit, but helping less fortunate people. So they did that, and as you can see in her face, she's just a sweetheart, bubbling over with love to everyone she meets. She's our creator at the church now. <laughs> she just gives you a big shake and hug. But people ran her over um, and stopped paying their debts. And she did not want to employ anybody else to collect on the debt. She wanted someone as sweet and as nice as her to come and deliver a hug <laughs> and ask for their monthly payment. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so she was having some issues and said, I went to the bank one day uh, to talk about the mortgage on our house. And we had to remortgage it to keep this thing going. So I went to the bank one day, and they were sharing with us how we're going to lose our house if we don't get this thing fixed and straightened up. And in her house, keep in mind, she houses two of her daughters and four of her grandkids and her husband. Um, so it's very important that this house stays in the family. Long story short, she runs into a guy out on the street, a Colombian man. And this Colombian man was bagging her for work. She said, no, 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 I'm not into that kind of work. So you got to understand, there's a huge racial gap between Ecuador and Colombia. They're bordering countries. Um, and the, in the mountains where we lived, um, the, the Sierra people, as they would call them, they believe that all of the crime in Ecuador is due to Colombians. Um, it, it's not true, and it, it's racist, but that is the general um, racial belief and slur there, that Colombians are violent um, and drug traffickers. So she said, no, 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 I don't want you collecting on my debts. I don't want any kind of that business. Next day, she gets a phone call from an unknown number. It's him. Hey, hola, mamita. Hey, lady. Like, I need you to hook me up with a job. And she says, no, 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 I'm not into that. Three days later, she's downtown, goes to the bank again. She sees him on the streets, and she realized he's a street kid. And so her heart was overwhelmed with compassion. 
she lets him move in. She says, I'll give you a job, but I'm also going to give you a roof. And I, so she said, I bought him a bed, I bought him a dresser, and I bought him a desk. We put him up in the side room of our house, gave him a job, he began to collect on the debts. People were paying up. Well, Guadalupe, because she owned her own credit union, which was just her, um, she stashed all of her life savings under her mattress when he would deliver the payments. And he lived with her for six months, and six months later, the $30,000, her life savings to pay off her house that she had stored under the mattress, were all stolen by the man that she welcomed in off the streets. So you can imagine her heartache, her pain, realizing that her kids and her grandkids might all be stuck on the streets of Ambato, Ecuador now because a man that she loved and let in betrayed her. So she's sharing this story with me here for the first time literally in this picture and you can see the smile on her face um, because Guadalupe after she met the Lord found hope. But the reason why her hair was falling out and the reason why her blood pressure went through the roof and the reason why she was having seizures and couldn't sleep at night was because she didn't know how she was going to provide for her kids and her grandkids to have a, a roof over their heads anymore. So fast forward after that, another two months later, Guadalupe comes up on stage and she says, Pastor, I want to share a testimony. <laughs> and she shares a story that none of us knew about all the medication she was on before she started coming to church. And she said, you know, before I came to church, you know, before Love Extreme, I was having high blood pressure, I was going through seizures, I couldn't sleep at night, I had sleep apnea, like all these things going on. And she said, I tried all the churches in town. I tried the Jehovah's Witnesses, I tried the Mormons, um, I went to the Catholic Church, and every time I went, there was just a weird spiritual vibe, and I, I just knew it wasn't right. And she said, but then when I came here in your church, I felt something that was so pure and so loving, and I said, this is, this is right. Later, she learned that that was the presence of God, right? Amen? Um, and she said, I decided when I came in, if God really loves me this much, then he will heal me. And she said, so I stopped taking all of my medication when I came to this church. She had several different pills that she took every day. Um, and all of us were just sitting there like, wow, this lady is crazy. Uh, but she's awesome. And so she said, I stopped taking all of my meds. And she's sharing this three months later. And, you know, she's like, She's like, my skin tone has returned to its normal color. I can sleep at night now. My, you can ask my husband. He says, my hair is all grown back. Like everything. She had these bald patches. Um, and so the Lord healed her 100% from her faith. Amen? Right, right. right? You can give the Lord a hand for that. It was pretty cool. So uh, fast forward now. It's over. Um, we're coming up. Yeah, we're over a year now. And she still takes no meds. The Lord has totally healed her of all of her conditions prior. Um, so then you fast forward another month, and she shares a story about tithing. She said, you know, at these other churches I checked out, I had heard that you're supposed to give some money to the Lord. I didn't know why. And she said, you know, but my husband and I, we don't make a lot of money. But I thought, you know what? I want to be obedient with my tithe and start to give. <laughs> so this is the same lady. Every, like, month or two, she just had a wonderful testimony. She said, you know, so I came with my husband, Mario, and I put our 10% tithe in the offering. It was $30, $20. And she said, that week, my husband and I made more money in one week at his painting job. That's what he does, painting cars, than we had ever made painting cars. He works on commission. So the Lord just began to bless them as well. So we're like, all right, this is amazing. God is changing her life. Remember the story of Legion? We sat down, you got clothed, you got a right mind. Let's keep going. So then, a couple months later, she comes back. She says, Pastor, I got a testimony to share. All right. <laughs> so this is so good. So she shares how her son-in-law, so her daughter's husband, her son-in-law, he works in a factory. Now, in Ecuador, the unemployment rate is very high. So if you have a job, even low paying, you should just keep it because if you lose your job, the odds of getting a new one are really hard. So factory jobs, though, it's a man, he was working a manual labor job, so the turnover rate's pretty high. If you can't do your job, you're out the door, they'll find somebody else. So they were going to do a physical aptitude test, uh, a test to prove that your physical shape was worthy of working in their factory. If not, they'd hire from the long list of unemployed people that needed a job. Well, her son-in-law was born with a crooked spine. Um, they had the x-rays and everything to prove it. 
And so she said she is not. She did not come up front to ask for prayer for her son-in-law. She came to share what happened. And she said, so we all got together and we started praying. And I told her, I said, no, nope, God's going to heal you. Keep in mind, Adiel and I as the leaders had not even taught her about praying for the sick yet. So she was just going for it. She said, we got together in our living room. They didn't call the pastors. No. Did they call the missionaries? No. They just got together as a family. They laid hands on him and just prayed, God, heal our son so he doesn't lose his job. That was it. So he goes into the work aptitude test to his same doctor who diagnosed him from birth. And they ran the x-rays, and he's like, he was pretty confident. Keep in mind, he was not a believer. He was pretty confident he was going to lose his job. They ran the x-rays. Church, tell me what they found. They didn't find a crooked spine. They found a perfectly straight spine. And the doctor turned and said, I don't know what happened, but your spine is different. Right? Praise the Lord. So what happened was she was inspired by the testimony, but she was changed by the man as she met him. But there was a bigger piece to that puzzle, and it's called forgiveness. When she went that night to Love Extreme, the man, the Colombian man who worked for the drug cartel who was speaking, he got down on his knees and he asked for forgiveness to the Ecuadorian population who had been damaged by the drug trade in Ecuador by Colombians. If you remember, it was a Colombian man who robbed her of her life savings, and she was holding on to so much bitterness in her heart, her body began to deteriorate. So that night, she didn't only receive forgiveness from her sins, she forgave the Colombian man who wronged her. And then Jesus let her sit at his feet, and she was able to be restored. She was dressed, her mind was healed, her body was healed, her son's in laws spine was healed, her finances were healed. And I want to continue this story. I didn't even put it in my notes. I saw her last week, right? I literally saw her last week, and I gave him the biggest hugs ever. Um, I should have put the picture in there. But I saw her last week, and the Lord has been redeeming their story even to this day. When I left Ecuador, and we left the church in the local leader's hands that we raised up, the, the big what if was, are you going to lose your house or not? They were still in this repo deal with the bank and two mortgages, and it was up for sale, and nobody was buying it, so they let them still live there. And so we left praying, and every time I'd go back and visit, there was no new news. And every time I'd go back and visit, they'd say, well, we're just believing God is going to, he's going to take care of us. And I'm like, amen, and we'd pray for him. And I was there last week, and I hugged her, and I just prayed over her, and they told me, they said, we lost our house, we all had to leave. God gave us a new house right down the road, twice as big, $100 less a month, and it has a garden in the back for me to cook for everyone. She calls it my paradise. So she said, David, she said, we're going to buy that house, and you're going to come and eat at our paradise. I said, yes, I am. In Jesus' name, we bless that meal that's coming. Um, so that is, just, that is one of many of my favorite stories that God did there in Ambato, and I want those testimonies to inspire you guys. But I challenge you today, if you don't know the source, right. if you don't know the man who hung there, that's not there anymore, who died and rose again on the third day, and he said, I got all authority. This is after he rose from the dead, right? He's like, I got all authority, therefore go. Today, we need to meet the man. Amen. So, when we talk about giving to missions, first we need our hearts to get changed. Um, so I invite you guys to stand. Turn on just an instrumental song. Well, <laughs> it's probably safer, not. <laughs> we'll leave it. <laughs> I like to invite you guys to extend your hands like this to receive a gift because God is a giver. It says He's the giver of all good things and that all good things come from above. And close your eyes with me in prayer. And I want you guys right now first to examine your heart. Say, so God, examine my heart. Is there anywhere in there that I have not let you be the Lord? You already know your sicknesses and your problems and your addictions and your afflictions and your fears and your anxieties. And I want you to say, God, sit me at your feet. Just wherever you're at, however you pray. Say, God, put me at your feet. God, clothe me. God, restore my mind. And just say, God, I want to know you. Jesus, let me know you today. I don't know what you guys are dealing with. I don't know where you're at. But I just say, Jesus, come and get to know your bride. Jesus, come and know your favorite children. They're here. 
Jesus, I ask you, Lord, to pour out healing over all fear and anxiety in this room. In Jesus' name, be gone. I break off right now every chain of addiction. Break off right now every chain of fear in Jesus' name. And I break off right now every fear of the unknown because God is a good God and he has good plans for his kids. He told that to Jeremiah and we hold on to that promise today. Jesus, we ask you, Lord, to reveal to your children today the status of their hearts. But we ask you, Lord, to give them a new name. God, we ask you, Lord, to clothe them. We ask you, Lord, to restore their mind. God, we know that you are restoring your children, you're restoring your church. And I thank you, Lord, and I pray that you would bless this congregation to an unsurpassed um, amount of blessing, Father. I pray, Lord, that as they give, you would overflow. God, we know that we can never outgive you, Lord. We know that we can never outserve you, Lord. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. So, God, I pray, Lord, that you would seal that word on our hearts today, Lord, that we can come and sit at your feet and you promise to restore us. God, I pray, Lord, that you would make yourself known to every man, woman, and child in the room today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, you guys are awesome. <laughs> Bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen.